everyone, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. Today's video is a interesting subject, and that is Northern Harriers in Falconry. Now, before you get too excited or too dismissive, uh, this is a subject that is interesting to every falconer or prospective falconer. Now, I know some people jump to the reaction, ah, harriers can't be used in falconry, and other people like, oh, I wanted to know this, my entire interest in falconry. I promise if you watch this whole video, you will learn something new, you'll find something of interest, and uh, you might be surprised on some of the results. So I wanna talk first about harriers just as a species, uh, a little bit of their biology, a little introduction to them, and also, and then of course go into their use in falconry. <clears throat> now, this video is gonna be about the Northern Harrier. The Northern Harrier is a species that ranges throughout North America, and there is a similar relative throughout Northern Asia and Europe called the Hen Harrier. There are scientists who think that the Hen Harrier and the Northern Harrier are subspecies of the same family. I have no experience with hen harriers, so I don't know if this same information would apply well, but it, but it definitely applies to the northern harrier. There are harriers all over the world. Most countries that have one harrier will have multiple species of harrier. Uh, the United States is not that way. The only one we have is the northern harrier. They are beautiful birds. They used to be called marsh hawks. It was sort of a nickname, kind of like calling a, a kestrel a sparrow hawk or a peregrine falcon a duck hawk, but it's just... It's just sort of a nickname, but they are, the harrier is a family of birds of prey that branched off from the rest of the other families a long time ago. And they are, they're, they're very different than other hawks and other birds of prey. Harriers are structurally built quite a bit different. If, um, if you're a bird watcher or a biologist and you're doing field observations or you're looking your field guide and you're like, oh, how long are they? What's their wingspan? You get, a, you get an incorrect perception of these birds because some of their measurements aren't that different as far as wingspan and total length to that of, say, a red-tailed hawk. And you might think, oh, they're similar sized birds. Oh, they're nothing like that. They, uh, they are built very similar in size and weight to a cooper's hawk. But feathers, they have ridiculously overly long wings for their body weight and overly long tails. This makes them incredibly buoyant and incredibly agile. Now, buoyancy is good uh, for not using up your energy. It, normally, anytime you're flapping and flying, you're burning calories, but a harrier can do that almost without doing that. So remember, even though their length and their wingspan is similar to a larger soaring bootio like a red-tailed hawk, remember by weight and by structure, bone, skeleton size, they're much closer to a cooper's hawk. Now, they are active hunters, but they are smart enough to scavenge. They love road kills, which normally for a very uh, daintily built raptor with a lot of agility, you don't see that. Usually the larger the raptor, the more willing they are to scavenge because there's a, it's a, it's a huge caloric demand. And But these birds are small and yet they're happy to scavenge. But they've taken that to a very odd level. They are the only raptor I know of that will predictively go towards gunshots. If uh, you're out target shooting and you go, blam, an eagle or a hawk will normally, oh no, there's something loud and scary and they'll get away. During the duck hunting season and during rabbit hunting season, people with guns, you'll watch a harrier flying along and it hears, bam, and a, whoa, it'll instantly turn and go towards the gunshots. And the reason is they are so smart, they have figured out humans and they figured out that if a human kills something, if they reach that kill quick enough, they might be able to steal it or at least get a few bites. Now, this is very unusual behavior with animals. I do know that gray jays in the, in the crow family are one of the other known birds to do that, where if they hear during big game hunting season, well, they'll, they'll hear, bam, they'll fly in the forest, try to find the deer or elk that's been shot and try to take a few bites near the bullet entry point. But I don't know of any other raptor species that will do that other than harriers, where they hear a gunshot and abruptly turn and fly towards it. Now, left to their own devices, they hunt a lot of rodents, but they're happy to hunt birds. They're happy to even hunt insects and invertebrates. Uh, they'll hunt, they'll hunt uh, lizards and frogs and things like that. They often live in marshes and prairies. That's basically, they'll live in deserts as well, as long as there's enough food, but they kind of like marshland and prairie land. Now, they 
do not like to still hunt. They don't like to hunt from a perch, which seems weird because normally if you're, you're a red-tailed hawk, you're like, I just sit on this perch and look around and there's, there's a rat, <laughs> dive down and catch it. You didn't use much energy just sitting there. Where if a red-tailed hawk is soaring, there's still enough flapping that you're burning through energy. It's better to perch. Harriers aren't that way. They spend almost all of their awake life on the wing. Because their oversized wings are so buoyant that they can just glide and ride and there's just very little weight on those oversized wings. Kind of similar to a turkey vulture. Different build, but same principle. Turkey vultures will travel hundreds of miles without even flapping because... They are so buoyant. Now, harriers also don't like to hunt from a great height. So you think about a falcon loves to circle around, wait on, dive down on prey from above. And hawks like to do that too. A lot of hawks like to be above. They're willing to dive down from a soar. Harriers don't. Uh, harriers would prefer to be three or four feet off the ground. And uh, they are tackling their prey using uh, an ambush technique. Their heads have a facial disc like an owl. Now their facial disc is not as well built, it's not as advanced as the facial disc of an owl, but it still functions the same way. It still funnels and channels sounds and amplifies them to the ears and gives some immense uh, directional sound finding abilities. So they're scanning and they're just soaring, gliding along, buoyantly a few feet above the ground. Now, we see these over bushes and over reeds and we're like, oh, it's just some sagebrush. Well, to the prey, think, think about something from, you know, the size of a mouse to the size of a cottontail rabbit. A sagebrush is a tree. That's as tall as a tree. A, it is to them what a tree is to us. So this uh, harrier coming in just over the top of this brush could be likened to a silent helicopter coming in for an ambush. And they're listening, 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 and the prey doesn't see them and they come over the tree, boom, and it's too late. Now, they don't have to be as fast to be able to do that. It works really well. Their facial discs, remember I said, are not as advanced. This is good when it comes to falconry. I'm not to the falconry section yet, but harriers can wear hoods just fine. Now, owls, their facial discs are so structurally elaborate that you don't want to mush those feathers in any way. Harriers, it's just fine. You put on a hood, whoosh, they, those feathers go back and you take off the hood poof, and they pop right back out. The best hoods to use are hoods for Cooper's hawks. Their, their, their actual skull structure is about identical to that of a decent sized Cooper's hawk. I do like the analogy of the helicopter because I think it gives you a better visual understanding. If you think of a falcon as a jet fighter that's way up high and pursuing an enemy fighter, whoa, doing these amazing things. Harriers are just skimming over the ground, scanning, and they want to do a quick, highly effective ambush hunt. Now that has to be factoring in, in falconry and I'll get into that in a few minutes. Harriers all over the world live on prairies and they live in marshes and um, what I've found though is if you're trying to find the density, if you're in just legitimate marsh like hey it's water 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 with a few reeds, there's definitely harriers there, but I find denser populations of harriers when it's sort of a dry marsh. Like, uh, there's patchy areas where it's sort of a bog. Uh, that's actually, you're gonna have denser areas. I mean, there are areas that are, have a higher, denser population of harriers if you're looking for them. One of the strange things about them is they are polygamous. Not always, they don't have to be, but they very regularly are, where you'll have a male harrier and he'll be supporting two to three females. Now, sometimes these females have their own separate nests. Sometimes uh, a male and a female will both support this female's eggs. Now, I don't know that a lot of research has been done on how that works or if they rotate from year to year which female lays eggs. There is a pair that I keep tabs on out in a desert near my house every year. And every year it's these three and it seems only one female lays eggs and they all, the male and female will defend the nest if you get near it and the other female actively uh, incubates the eggs. So a little unusual behavior with birds of prey, but for whatever reason, it seems to suit them well and uh, seems to give them a, an edge of survival. Now, as far as nests, harriers nest on the ground, but they don't actually build a nest. Usually they will nest on reeds, 
but sometimes they'll even nest where fallen reeds have even some water in them. It seems to defy logic. Why would you do something where where water could potentially cool down your eggs and uh, make them not hatch? But they do. They just kind of push some some reeds aside or push some grass aside and just lay their eggs directly on the ground. This amazes me that harrier species all over the world haven't gone extinct because that, again, seems to defy logic. Why would you nest on the ground? Now, as far as not building an actual structure, that's not that uncommon. A lot of birds don't. We know uh, hawks and eagles will build nests, but owls and falcons and caracaras don't build a nest. So there's a lot of other birds of prey that don't build a nest, but to just nest on the ground seems very unusual. Now, if you are going to a nest for any reason, whether you're a falconer pulling a baby or you're a biologist doing field studies or even a bird bander, it's good to be mindful of the fact that humans leave a scent that can be detected. Most birds cannot smell, but mammals can. There's a lot of terrestrial predators and you know, raccoons, coyotes, things like that, that if you uh, are around a nest too much, they might smell you and come to investigate and find these baby harriers. Now, it's almost irrelevant in principle because the harriers themselves have a smell and they're pooping around the nest and that smell is increasing. So again, terrestrial predators can find them too. But always the rule is you should be very cautious around a nest and never disturb a nest uh, more than you absolutely have to, especially be con conscious of your scent and what scent you're leaving. So if you're approaching a nest, I say wear some boots you don't normally wear, like some rubber boots, and get in and get out of the nest really quickly. Otherwise, if if you're observing a nest, use binoculars or a spotting scope and, and keep a fair distance away. Now, the babies grow very quickly, and they're interesting because, as with most birds of prey, the female is larger than the male, but their first year, their colors are identical. And they have these beautiful honey chestnut colors, all these reds and browns and rusty colors, and it, they're lovely. They're so beautiful and striking. And that's both males and females, their first year. Now their second year, this changes and the males turn uh, bluish gray. Some of them are very light color and some are legitimately blue and some really are a dark gray, but still, you know, whitish blue, blue, grayish blue, gray, right in there, the males are gonna be there, they're indistinguishable. The females change colors as well. And they go from those rich honey chestnut colors to a much duller uh, tan, where they're just some dark browns and some sandy tans and khaki colors. And uh, so they're very distinguishable from each other as adults. They're sexually dimorphic in their colors. Now, as for harriers in falconry, a lot of people shoot down the idea and a lot of people are excited by the idea. They see harriers and they think, wow, what a beautiful, unique bird. Does anybody fly them? And um, I'm gonna tell you some pros and some cons of both. And I have flown and hunted a couple harriers and I'm not the only person who has. But before you get into this, stay open-minded. It's, it's good to be open-minded in falconry. Uh, for example, it's if you say, well, even if you can train a harrier, why would you? There's birds that could accomplish the same feat more easily. Well, that's true with a lot of species. Kestrels, when I was uh, a young falconer, you know, 10 year old, and hearing some of the old timers, they're like, ah, Kestrel's just a toy. You can't do anything with them. And, uh, but nowadays, falconers using digital scales and weighing in grams and giving them the time and effort have proven Kestrels to be amazing hunting birds. Now it is true, that a, a kestrel does not have the athleticism and abilities to lend themselves to as amazing of chases as say a sharp shinned hawk or a merlin. But that doesn't mean they can't be trained and hunted and even hunted very effectively. I, I love blind kestrels. They're a lot of fun to hunt with. And uh, if they're done right, they can be used on a number of birds. And you can go the other extreme, golden eagles. Many falconers have the dream of flying a golden eagle someday. Well, I've flown both male and females and been very successful hunting rabbits. And I have to tell you, it's a lot easier to, if your only goal is, I want to catch some rabbits. Cool, that's great. Uh, go get yourself a Harris hawk or a goshawk. Now, golden eagles are built for rabbits. They do a great job hunting rabbits, but think about the weight on your arm. Think about the food bill. Think about the extra training. It's a lot harder to keep a golden eagle in shape than it is a goshawk. So if your only point is, well, I just want to get rabbits. Why would you ever get a golden eagle? 
most people who get a golden eagle and work to that point, it's because of a love of the species. They're like, wow, this would be a really neat style of flight to try out. And it is, it's really fun. Uh, same thing with gear falcons. If I wanna hunt ducks and pheasants, I'm gonna have more success in my opinion with a peregrine, but there's something about flying a gear falcon that is less practical, but really exciting and interesting and enjoyable. If we weren't open-minded and just stuck with old traditions, then red-tailed hawks and kestrels never would have been used in falconry and Harris hawks never would have been given a chance. And you think about all, all over the world, how many people hunt successfully with Harris hawks now? They've revolutionized the sport because people were open-minded. Now, that's not to say that I am saying, everybody go fly a Harrier. In fact, my main point is I don't think that they should be flown in almost most situations. But I wanna tell you how to do it if you're thinking about doing it. Now, I have, uh, like I said, I have flown a few Harriers, but the people who have truly uh, explored Harrier hunting are the falconers of New Zealand. A lot of people are unaware of this. There are only uh, two, well, kind of three. There were three native diurnal raptors in New Zealand. The Swamp Harrier, the New Zealand Falcon, and the Haas Eagle. The Haas Eagle is a comparatively recent extinction. It's an eagle so big that it actually ate moas and these giant flightless birds. And when humans arrived, originally was eating people. So it's a large eagle, but it's extinct. So you have two diurnal raptors filling all the roles. New Zealand falcons are, are very rare and they're, uh, they're related to Oplomato falcons, interestingly enough. And swamp harriers are a type of harrier that have had to fill a lot of roles. Now they're still active hunters and they're scavengers, uh, but they are the only bird allowed to be used as a trained hunting bird in New Zealand. And so the New Zealand falconers fought for that right and they have trained them with hoods and trained them to hunt both rabbits and birds. And that is their, not only their only option, but they've had great success flying the, the swamp harriers. Now, the Northern Harrier is a little more diminutively built than the Swamp Harrier. And that's because uh, in, in North America, here is the ecological niche that, uh, that a Northern Harrier fills, where there's uh, very few raptor species in New Zealand, the Swamp Harrier fills more roles. So it's a little more robust, but still the principles are the same. They absolutely can be trained to hunt in falconry. When I decided many, many years ago that I wanted to try hunting Harriers, I just wanted to give it a whirl. I wanted to see what they were capable of. And my first thought was to remember, this is a species that does not like to hunt from a perch. Now, your hand is a perch as well. So I thought, how do you wrap your head around that? Now, uh, what I had seen is that imprinting, if you're trying to take a species and kind of alter uh, its normal hunting techniques a little bit to better fit your needs that's easier with an imprint so for example kestrels if you imprint a kestrel you can train them to chase after anything they might not be able to catch it but I mean, you can train them to come to a inflated garbage bag because they don't know any different where if you trap a passage kestrel yes you can train them to hunt birds but they've spent months or you know or half a year hunting mice and grasshoppers and now you're like we're gonna chase sparrows they're like but there's grasshoppers right here so I've always had more success hunting with imprint kestrels than I have with passage kestrels. Now compare that to like a peregrine falcon. A peregrine falcon, they naturally want to circle and dive on prey. And if you're teaching them, okay, leave my fist, go up, circle, follow me, and dive on prey, you're not altering that much. So, you know, it's you're not gaining or losing a whole lot by an imprint. So I figured that the same thing would work well for me with a Harrier. So the Harriers I flew were imprints. And in doing so, I was able to like, here's your natural progression. You're getting fed by your parents. And then now I'm feeding you. And now I'm directing your hunting instincts towards certain scenarios. Now, what I had been doing in the years before is I had been hunting a lot of canal ducks. In Utah, we have, uh, in Northern Utah, we have a lot of canals. They're not very wide. They're, you know, six to 10 feet wide and only a few feet deep. And they usually have trees on both sides. And the ducks that live there are wild, but they're fairly used to humans because a lot of times there's houses there. And I had used Harris hawks and had hunted a lot of these canal ducks. And I thought, could you do that 
with a Northern Harrier. Could you off the fish, train them to do that? So I tried it first and I, I got them to fly to a lure. And then what I started to do was I made duck dummies, duck decoys that were upright. Now I mimicked usually mallards. Most of my decoys were mallards. I even tried with a Canadian goose, but I always made them larger than the real birds. And I just constructed them out of fabric and hangers and things. And I'd put them in the canals where ducks would usually be uh, up on the side of the canal. And I would tie a string around the neck of the decoy and put some meat there. And I'd walk along before these harriers were even fully uh, hard penned. So they could fly, but their feathers were just finishing up growing in. And I trained them instead of a lure, like you just go and you grab this duck shaped thing, knock it over and then eat the meat off of the neck. And then I will come over and give you an even bigger reward. They were keying in on that really well. Then once we, once the feathers were in all the way and we were getting into the fall, then I would have uh, friends with a uh, fishing line on either side of the canal pulling. So this duck on the bank is sitting there, a fake duck, like a, a dummy duck. And the harrier would go grab onto the neck and they would pull. So you have that motion of something big and heavy moving all over. So remember, harriers are similar in weight and build to a Cooper's hawk. So they're not giant, despite their wings looking so big. This seemed to work really well. When it came to hunting though, this initial experiment, uh, once I was getting into the fall, as I was walking out and the bird was at weight, their instinct was to want to fly off. They weren't baiting like an occipiter, but remember their instinct is to just kind of always wander slowly. And this would flush the ducks. So I practiced and eventually was able to fly them out of the hood similar as to you could with a lot of hawks and eagles where you have them hooded, but the hoods open and back. And as you approach the ducks, you take off the hood and you yell, ho, ho, ho. And they see him go after it. Did have success doing this technique, but harriers don't like to chase long distances. So even though I did have success and it was able to be accomplished, it clearly was not the best technique. Now, the New Zealand falconers, they have harriers that are a little chunkier and again, are a little more willing to pursue birds that are flushed up. But what I generally saw was that if the duck took off and the harrier started to chase, if that duck went more than 10 feet, the harrier was like, nah. And remember, they in that closed setting, they didn't quite know what to do. They didn't know, hey, just fly right back. So. It worked, but it wasn't the best technique with those walls. I think if it was open canals where they could circle around you a couple times and come back to your fist, that would have been more successful. So I figured maybe it's better to try to play to the natural strengths of these Harriers, which again, what they want to do is they want to circle around. They want to just wander. Now, I've seen this done a lot of times with Fruginous Hawks. I've had friends that like to, instead of hunting off the fist with their Fruginous Hawks, they will let them, they'll be the walking perch and they'll let the, the Fruginous circle around, land back, circle around, land back, circle around, land back. And anything that flushes up, great. So I thought, is this a technique that could be used for Harriers? And so we had near my home, a lot of uh, areas of bunch grasses where we had sparrows and quail and cottontail rabbits. And then there it's open. There's no trees, there's no perches, there's no distractions. And we would try that same technique and it worked well to just go walking around and let them fly, let them circle, come back, circle, come back. And just us walking out there, anything that got flushed, they would dive. Now, this is a really specific technique. This is not something that's generalized. Like think of all the different scenarios that a Harris Hawk would work well in. Well, this is, it, it, this is basically just letting a Harrier be a wild Harrier. You just happen to be coming along for the ride and you're a perch here and there. And uh, they, again, they have to be, they, they do fly to the lure well and they can fly to the fist well if they're raised from an imprint. But that it's not that harriers are bad birds it's that this style of falconry is not appealing to everybody the idea of let's just go walking through a field and let this bird wander five feet off the ground and come back five feet around and come back is not super appealing and not only that more importantly are you going to find the prey you need to find if you live in an area with a high density of quail this technique actually could work very well for you we didn't have as many quail we were mostly flushing sparrows and so we switch it up 
to hedgehogging. And this is kind of a combination of two styles. We would find as we got later into the winter, which bushes would hold uh, all of the sparrows and starlings that where they would bunch in after they had been feeding for the day and then they go into the bushes to stay away from predators. And we would know, we, we would figure out where these places were and then we did the technique I mentioned before, just walking and letting the harrier go and land on all of our fists, different people, we'd all have gloves. And then when we would get up to that bush, I would start swinging the lure and the harrier would notice and start flying over towards me to come to the lure. And then I would run at the bush, charge it, and just punch or kick into the bush at the right time. So all of the sparrows and starlings come flying out and the harrier would just meet them head on. Now, Again, that seems like a very strange form of falconry. It works, but it's a very, very specific type of thing. But humans have come up with stranger things. In medieval times in Europe, hobby falcons were trained to do a very odd thing. They weren't very good for direct pursuit flights, but they knew birds were afraid of them. So they would train a hobby falcon to circle above and scare larks and sparrows into a, a big bush and they would just throw a net over the bush and then they just reach in and grab the sparrows for food. It's medieval Europe, they hate sparrows. It's like a miniature turkey, a little roasted turkey. It's like, that's clearly even less falconry than what I'm describing with a harrier. But my point is, I think it is better to fight for legal rights. And if a very few people every few years say, I think I'm gonna try a harrier and go out and hunt them in these ways, Great, I'd rather that than say, let's ban as many birds from the sport as possible. Because if you really want to train a harrier, you can hunt them in this hedgehogging way. They'll do great. Uh, if you're gonna do a lot better hunting a Merlin or a sharp hawk or a Cooper's hawk in those same fields, if your goal is only, I want to catch as many sparrows as possible. But if you have a love of the species and you think harriers are amazing and you wanna fly one, then this is the way to do it. They're great. Now, when it comes to training and equipment and husbandry, not a lot of people have actually flown or trained Harriers. And that's in fact one of the things I point out. The, the people who say, well, uh, they're a horrible falconry bird. I'm like, well, they perhaps so, but have you ever tried one? Well, I no. I'm like, okay, well, if I get why you might not want to try one because again, you could accomplish things better with another species. But if you haven't tried one, why are you being so vocal about how terrible they are? Uh, so when it comes to actual equipment, if you're actually going to train one, as far as the jesses, you traditional jesses and anklets, Almory jesses work. But remember, their legs are really skinny and really long. Think of uh, like an, an oversized sharp shinned hawk with these tiny little pencil legs. And you do not want to put excessive stress on those long, skinny, vulnerable legs. So you want to make the anklets uh, broader, deeper, taller. That distributes the weight further out if they bait and uh, helps keep them healthier and happier. I, I also um, think that even though they can use a wide range of perches, remember they are not built to do a lot of perching. They mostly are flying all day long. So the perch I definitely came to prefer with both of mine was a bow perch. A, the reason is not, not that a block perch or a ring perch couldn't work just fine, but their legs are so long. And then if they have those jesses on, that straddle space is really big. And it, it's even with good, good small jesses, it's easy for them to accidentally straddle a perch and uh, damage your feathers, which you don't want, of course. So a bow perch is a good design. It allows them to jump, get back up, and feel safe, no problem. As far as the hood, it's an indispensable tool when flying Harriers. And again, I recommend a, a Cooper's Hawk hood. I use Dutch hoods. I have not tried Cooper's Hawk uh, Anglo-Indian hoods, but it's definitely worth a try. But I found that Dutch Cooper's Hawk Dutch hoods worked perfectly for them, both males and females. They fit them just fine. They ride a, an imprint Harrier that's hood trained properly. They hood easily. They'll ride hooded very well. And that is good because, again, remember, if you've flown an occipiter of any kind, you know there's kind of this edginess. Uh, that is even more so in a harrier, but it's not because they're an agitated, high-strung species. It's because their instinct is, I've got to be flying nonstop or I'm going to starve. And the longer you've worked with them, 
the, the more that goes down, they're like, oh, I'm okay. But hooding them and either flying them out of the hood or, um, or just hooding them. And then once you get to the field, taking the hood off and letting them range around, it works great. But you, I found that having them travel in a dark travel box did not work nearly as well. And that their agitation level was higher than you would expect for a visual based bird. So hood, it's a perfect tool keeps them calm, they'll travel well, and they hood and unhood with no problem. And again, remember, those side feathers flatten perfectly when the hood goes on, and when you take the hood off, they pop right back off. So overall, my general recommendation, if somebody says, I, I'm thinking about flying a Harrier, my general recommendation is don't. However, if you love the species and you've flown a number of other birds of prey and had a lot of success hunting and training, then I'm all for it. Just uh, a lot of falconers are negative towards the idea of hunting a new species. And it's understandable because they're sharing their views based off of experience and traditions. And again, harriers are not the best bird for hunting game. This is the reason why owls are not usually hunted in falconry. Owls are wonderful hunters, but the type of hunting they do is not as conducive as forming a hunting partnership with humans. Same thing with ospreys. There, what bird could be a more uh, perfect hunter than an osprey? Seeing in the water, diving down in the water, multiple feet deep, catching fish and flying out. They're incredible. A lot of people said, I'd love to fly a, a, an osprey. But the thing is, that form of hunting is not extremely conducive to working with a human because once they caught their fish, it's not like you're rowing out in a boat to pick them up. And their instinct is to go fly and land in a tree where they're gonna eat their food and then, then what do you do? Does that mean an osprey cannot be trained in falconry? No, no, it doesn't. And if a person in a, in a country where that was legal had enough interest and enough extra effort they were willing to put in, then an osprey could be trained as well too. So again, I think it is good to keep an open mind and I think it's good to help people considering a new strange species. It's good to share your expertise. Don't shoot down a dream, but help them understand the reasons why it's not a good idea. And if they choose that they want to follow that dream, help, uh, help them have the most success and understand that it's going to take a lot of extra effort to have the successful hunting experience. And that is also the case with Harriers. Well, if you have any questions about Harrier hunting, uh, please let me know below. Again, my experience is limited, but it was successful. And if you have other videos you'd like to see me produce, just let me know down in the comments below. And as always, happy hawking. Mm -hmm.